Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Thanks for joining us. I want to ask you a question. How is your journey? Somebody said life is a trip, and that's really true. Our life is a journey, and we're traveling and moving day by day, step by step. And this is actually a theme that we see running all through the Bible. The most common word in the New Testament to describe the Christian life is the word walk. You know, walking, we, we do that when we want to go from point A to point B. But in the Bible, this, this word walk is a metaphor for the Christian life. It's what we do. We're walking it out. We're, we're living it out. And it's every decision that we make uh, one step at a time, day by day, one decision at a time. And so, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, We walk by faith not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. And because life is a journey, we're just walking through this journey together, there's going to be some sudden changes. There's going to be some transition. There's going to be some turns. There's going to be some bends in the road, some twists, some ups and downs, and some detours, and some traffic even. Our journey is going to have some transition in it. Let me give you here a good definition for transition. Transition is unexpected, disruptive change. And that's where we are right now. COVID-19 has changed everything for everybody on this planet. And uh, it reminds me of the song by Little Richard, A Whole Lot of Shaking Going On. And there's a whole lot of shaking. There's a whole lot of change going on. And COVID-19 is going to mark us all like 9-11 did, like Pearl Harbor did. This is another kind of huge global event. We don't know what it's going to look like on the other side, but it's going to be different because everything has changed. Now to help us as people of God, we have examples for us in the Bible, examples of others who have walked the same journey that you and I are walking today. And so for the next few weeks to find direction and hope and encouragement, we're gonna be looking at one of these guys. His name was Moses, his life was filled with transition, and we're gonna be calling this series Thankful Through the Transition. So yeah, his life was filled, guys, with unexpected change. This guy spent two thirds of his life walking in the wilderness, step by step, and day by day. And we see so many, like, just big changes in his life. He was born a slave with nothing, but he grew up in the palace uh, under Pharaoh's leadership, and he had access to the best education. And then in the prime of his life, he lost everything, and he made a terrible moral failure. He murdered a man. And then he had to run for his life and he became a shepherd in the wilderness where he pretty much shoveled sheep poop for a long, long time, thought his life was over. And then God called him and said, no, I want you to be a deliverer. And he went back to, to Egypt and for 40 years led God's people to the promised land. So massive change. And we're going to study his life over the next few weeks together. He became the greatest leader of the Old Testament, the greatest prophet God used him to write the Ten Commandments and the laws and to build the tabernacle and so much. But his life resembles our life because of the ups and downs that he went through. And God led him through each one, and God will lead us through as well. So before we jump into his life, we want to look at Exodus 1 because it sets the stage for his life. And it helps us appreciate, you know, the context in which he was born and so we're going to jump in there. We're going to see massive, disruptive transition and change. So let's check it out. Exodus 1, 1 through 5, it says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, and Dan, and Naphtali, and Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. 
And so before it jumps into Moses, it really talks to us about how the children of Israel got to Egypt in the first place. You see, there was this global famine, and uh, before the famine hit, Joseph's brothers were jealous of him because he had this coat of many colors and they sold him as a slave. He winds up in Egypt and God raises him up to be the second most powerful person in the land. And then this famine hits and to save his family, he invites his father Jacob and he forgives his brothers who betrayed him and sold him as a slave. And he brings them into Egypt and he gives them a place called Goshen to live, gives them food to eat, and their lives are saved. And that's how the children of Israel got into Egypt. But Exodus goes on to tell this in verse 6 through 7. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Now, in these just few verses, hundreds of years pass. How many know time flies? Well, time was flying, and the children of Israel, man, they're, they've got their roots in Goshen, and they are just doing life, and they're growing exponentially. And in these verses are just, I want you to notice, there are five phrases that talk about numerical growth. Exceedingly fruitful, multiplied greatly, Increased in number, so numerous, the land was filled with them. And so they came into to Egypt, just 70 in number. But over the years, they began to burst at the seams and grow. And there were new schools and new playgrounds, new parks, new housing developments, new shopping centers, new businesses. They were exploding and they came in as a little tribe and in their time in Egypt there, they grew into a great nation. Now what was happening here? The old promise that God gave to Abraham was being fulfilled in their lifetime. Genesis 12 2, here it was. Long ago, he promised to Abraham when he was married to his barren wife, Sarah, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation and I will bless you. And so they're living in this season of blessing and fulfillment. God's promise has come to pass and they're just growing and multiplying and God's favor and God's blessing is on them. Now, in the middle of our transition, I just want to this is kind of the first thing that we have to hold on to. Here it is. In Jesus, we are now the favored and blessed children of God. And you just need to know that. And you need to fix your hope and your mind on that. That promise that God gave to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make you into a mighty nation so that you can bless the world. Because of Jesus, we're now children of faith. We're children of Abraham. And so God wants to bless us too. He wants to direct us and multiply us and grow us and open doors and connect us with the right people, not just for ourselves, so that we can be a blessing to other people. Now, I love this in Galatians 4, 7, it says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you and air. And so I just want us all to get fixed on that in our hearts today. And I want you just to say this after me today. Say this with me. In Jesus, I am a favored and blessed child of God. Now, children get special treatment. I mean, children have direct access to dad and mom. They know how to tug on the heartstrings. Let me give you an example of this, this week. You know, our, my kids said, hey, Dad, I want to go fishing in the neighborhood pond, which sounded like a complete drag to me because we all know that the, the yard chemicals wash in there. But I said, okay, I'll take you. We didn't have any bait, so we made bread balls out of loaves of bread. And we went out there, and I just was watching them fish to get them out of house, get, get them off their electronic devices. And my son put his pole down, and I picked it up and rolled a little ball of bread and put it on the hook threw it out there right under this bush 
And I'm not kidding you, I had a huge hit from a very large fish on a piece of bread and began to reel that thing in, fighting with that fish. And my son said to me, Dad, can I have your pole? Now, if it was a neighborhood kid who said to me, Dad, can I, you know, Mr. Whitlow, can I have your pole? It'd be like, who are you? Uh uh. But my, my son said to me, Dad, can I have your pole? And I gave him the pole, and the fish broke the line. And that was another conversation, but I'd do anything for my, my son because he knows how to pull on my heartstrings. And you need to get this mindset. We need to begin to see ourselves, how God sees us. We are the favored and blessed children of God because of Jesus. And I just want to ask you today, what are you believing for? Here in the middle of COVID-19 in this season of uncertainty, what are you believing for? What are you asking for? Because we have direct access to God and we are His favored children. Now, this crazy growth it caught the attention of a brand new king, a brand new pharaoh. Look here at Exodus 1, 8 through 10. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said, the people, the Israelites have become far too num numerous for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly. Notice the very first four words of this little section of scripture here. Then a new king. So this was a new king, a new policy, a new season, a new approach, transition. Didn't see it coming. And as the king of Egypt, he saw the growth happening in the children of Israel. And he began to be jealous and insecure and afraid of what was going on. And uh, he began to hate the children of Israel. And he said, let us deal shrewdly with them. First, this is what he did. He started with a lie. And he said, hey, if, if our enemies attack us, these Hebrews are going to turn against us and they're going to fight with our enemies and they're going to conquer us. And then the second thing that he did is in one decree, he took away their freedoms and he made all the children of Israel slaves and he began to work them to build his empire. And so hands that wrote books and hands that did business and hands that sewed and made things and made cakes and hands that provided goods and services, all of a sudden those hands began to work in the mud and they began to make bricks and the cracks of whips were heard over their heads. And booming Goshen in a moment became a work camp for slaves. And his hope was to decrease their numbers and zap their energy and destroy their influence and potential. That's what he wanted to do. But surprisingly, check this out, what happens? Exodus 1, 12, it says, But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians became to dread the Israelites. Would you say that word with me, more? The more he oppressed the more God blessed the Israelites and the more they grew. And so it was kind of like that whack-a-mole game. You ever play whack-a-mole at Chuck E. Cheese? You know, you whack the mole on the head, then up, up pop like three other moles over here, and you whack those and up pop more. The more he whacked the Israelites in one place, God popped up more blessing in another place, and there was nothing that he could do. Here's the second thing we need to remember. In times of uncertainty and transition, God uses the schemes of powerful people and circumstances to propel us toward a better future. I want to say it again. God uses the schemes of powerful people and circumstances to propel us toward a better future. It looks like they're done for. I mean, they had no standing army. They had pitchforks, they had shovels, and the most influential world leader, man, he hates them and he wants to make their lives miserable. And it was nothing they did. They didn't do anything wrong. Someone just decided in a position of power to make their life miserable. And when we look at this king, 
we're not looking at just a mean boss. We're looking at the face of evil, his heart boiled with hatred, racism, and pride. What a disruptive transitions. Transition. Man, transitions have a way of messing up our routine, don't they? Transitions have a way of messing up our schedule and leading us into a time and a season of uncertainty. And when things are uncertain, after transition has hit, we ask these questions like, am I going to survive? How am I going to make it? How am I going to get through this? What is God doing? Does God even care? And we have to remember, guys, in the middle of transition, this wonderful promise of Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are the called according to his purpose. If you love God, all things, the good and the bad, the transitions and the seasons of uncertainty work together for good for those who love God. And if you feel like some other person or event is controlling your life, I want you to remember this. God takes what the devil meant for evil and he turns it upside down and he uses it for our good to strengthen us, to grow us, to expand us, and to position us for a better future. You got to believe that. Because here the children of Israel, they were content to live in a little backwater town off to the side of Egypt. They were content to live out their days in Goshen. But instead of living in Goshen, God had something much bigger, much better. They couldn't even imagine. They couldn't even see it. And so he wanted to bring them out and lead them in to the promised land. But to do that, he had to stir the pot a little bit. I just want to say to you today that the big movers and shakers in the world today and in your life are tiny compared to your God. I want to say that again. The movers and shakers over you in your life that sometimes we wonder, does this person have control over me? You need to know they're tiny compared to your God. This Pharaoh that seems so big, we don't even know his name today. And everything that he built is in dust. People may lie. People may obstruct. People may hinder you. People can talk about you. But people cannot stop your great God and his plans for you, for your family, and for your life. Guys, a great example of this is uh, the leader of the Union forces in the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant. When the, when the war started, he was kind of a nobody, and everybody, the rumor was that he was a drunkard, which was like, man, you were a cocaine dealer back in the day. Don't have anything to do with people like that because they're not reliable. And they, get, they didn't know what to do with Grant, so they gave him a little force, a little, little battalion to lead, and Grant started winning. He started taking the fight to the Confederacy, and he caught the attention of the president, Abraham Lincoln. And all the generals around Lincoln were insecure and they began to lie about Grant and say, this guy's a drunkard. He can't be trusted. He's a drunkard. He can't be trusted. And the more they talked about him, the more Lincoln began to notice him and, and to really like him. And so they brought it up again, this guy's a drunkard. And finally, Abraham Lincoln said, okay, well, if he's a drunkard, I want you to find out where he buys his whiskey and I want you to send a barrel of it to all of my generals. And so what happened was slowly Grant got promoted through the adversity of those around Lincoln and became the leader of all the Union forces. And just a few years later, he became our 18th president. Job 42, 2 says, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And I just have to say this today. COVID-19 cannot thwart the purposes of God. I just have to say that to you on your couch today. 
It's time for the, the people of God. Let's be people of faith. COVID-19 will not thwart the church. COVID-19 will not thwart the purposes of God. COVID-19 will not crush the gospel. COVID-19 will not crush the kingdom of God. God will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what the enemy has meant for evil, God will turn it upside down and he will use it for good to bring glory to his name. Nothing in all the earth can stop or thwart the purposes and the good plans of God. And so that being the case, here's my, my final thought I want to give you today. In the season of uncertainty, make God number one. In the season of uncertainty, make God number one. Now, mean old Pharaoh, what, he, he decided to turn up the heat another notch. He wasn't going to give up. You know, things around, keep everything he does kind of turns upside down. And so he calls in two Hebrew midwives and their names were Shifra and Pua. And he commanded them this. He said, here's what I want you to do. This is not a suggestion. It's an order. Every time you go in to help a Hebrew mom give a baby, if you see a boy, you are to kill it. That was the command. Now think about it. This is their chance to escape. This is their chance to earn favor with the Pharaoh. This is their chance to, to be rewarded and to escape a life of slavery. What pressure! And I am sure they were afraid for their lives as they left his court. But check this out. Exodus 1.17, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. And they let the boys live. They feared God. And you just need to know today that the world, our culture, wants to squeeze you into its mold. It wants to pressure you. And it wants to make you follow its plans. The culture wants to tell you what to do and what decisions to make and how to live your life. And we just need to... Today, come on, let's make up our mind today, right now. Who are we going to serve? Because I don't think these, these Hebrew midwives even thought about it. They were just like, nope, not going to do that. I, I, I'm not even going to think about that because I'm not doing that. And the reason why is they had a fear for the Lord. They weren't afraid of Pharaoh. They feared God even more. And that word fear isn't like God's about to slap me, so I'm going to cower in fear and terror. That word means they live with a holy sense of reverence, awe, wonder, and worship before God. And they said no to the face of Pharaoh. And the result, Exodus 1.20 says, So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. Now guys, this just runs through the whole chapter of Exodus 1. Numerous, increase, growth. They honored God. God blessed them with their families of their own and the people increased and became even more numerous. And we, when we make God number one in our lives, He blesses us today with His, with His favor. He just multiplies and opens doors, directs our steps, and blesses the work of our hands. The more Pharaoh turned up the heat, the more God sent down the blessing. And I want to ask you today, who are you serving? Whose voice are you listening to right now in the season of uncertainty? COVID 19's hit the planet. And the world is telling you what to do, what decisions to make. And I want to ask you something today. Who are you serving? And I want to encourage you today to serve the Lord. Because there is nobody like our God. He took all the plans and all the decisions of the most powerful person on the planet, Pharaoh, and turned them on their head and used them for good for his people. And nothing can stop the good purposes and plans of our God for you today. They're yours if you'll make Him number one in your heart. He'll pour His favor over your life today, over your business today, over your family today, over your finances today, because when God is number one, 
We want to just take whatever He's given us and be a blessing. We want to be a channel to others. Guys, all of this is ours. This promise that He will work all things for our good, for those who love God. I want to ask you today, where's your heart? And I want to give you an opportunity right now to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. Let's just go ahead and made up, make up our minds. I'm going to serve Jesus with all my life because He has great plans for me. I don't want to settle for Goshen. I don't want to settle for some backwater situation in my life because God wants to bring me out and lead me to the promised land. He's got something great for me. God's plans are way bigger than your little plans for your life. So let's stop following ourselves and let's follow Him today with all of our heart. If you're sitting there, I want you to pray this prayer with me in your heart today. Just, just pray this after me. Lord Jesus, I come to you right in the middle of this season of uncertainty. I rededicate my life to you. I surrender everything to you. And I make you number one. I'm not going to let the culture, I'm not going to let the world, and I'm not going to let Pharaoh squeeze me into its mold. I'm serving you. And Jesus, I want to become more like you. And I want to live in your purposes and plans. Thank you for giving me strength and grace today. And I worship you with all that I have. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I want to encourage you with this. You can make it through your season of uncertainty. We love you. You're in our thoughts and prayers. If there is anything that we can do, I want you to email us at info at rootschurch.tv. If you need encouragement, if you need prayer, Please don't hesitate. Don't be afraid. Reach out to us. We're standing together. We're excited about the season beginning to open up and us being able to meet again. I want to tell you guys, Roots Church is alive. It's well. This is not stopping us. What God's going to do, He's going to turn this around and use it for His good. So I want to encourage you to keep believing. Come on, let's keep standing. Let's keep believing. Let's keep pressing in because God is going to plant this church for His glory. This is going to be just part of our story, part of our testimony, because we've had more services online than we've had in person. But that's okay, because God's going to turn it around for His glory. But we are excited come in June because we're starting our very first uh, semester of small groups. Man, we've got some good groups planned. We've got a students group. Man, we've even got a karate group. Hiya. Woo! So, man, we want you to get connected. Hey, man, let's build some relationship. This is part of the vision being fulfilled right in our time for Roots Church. We not only gather for worship, but we connect for life transformation. So it's really exciting to see. We love you. You are in our thoughts and prayers. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful day.